Okay, so um, before the break, uh, we were discussing the role of lenders. Uh, should the loan agreement contain covenants, contain encumbrances uh, in so far as decision making in the company is concerned? There could be situations where there is a conflict between the interests of the lenders and the interests of shareholders which may lead to suboptimal decisions with corresponding uh, costs which are termed as agency costs. Now, we move on to some further properties uh, the which differentiate debt from equity. Uh, uh, interest is usually a fixed rate payment although we have a huge spectrum of debt instruments with various varieties of uh, uh, computational methods for the computation of return to the lenders, computation of interest. We have floating rate uh, bonds, we have uh, fixed rate bonds, we have index bonds and so on. There are so many huge massive variety of uh, such uh, instruments, but nevertheless the traditional bonds, the traditional debt instruments carry a fixed rate of interest and uh, whereas the dividend on the company is obviously not fixed. It is discretionary and it depends on the earning of profits of the company and not only on the earning of profits of the company, on the intention or the desire of the company to undertake further expansion for which it wants to retain a part of the profits or it wants to go about distribution of the profits to the owners of the company. So, to that extent, uh, interest is usually a fixed, uh, uh, fixed rate payment, whereas dividends are discretionary, dividends are variable rate, they may change from year to year depending on the profitability of the company and as prescribed or as uh, decided by the shareholders in general meeting of the company. Now, we come to the most important property that differentiates interest and dividend. That property uh, goes to the root of the, the or the fundamental uh, philosophy of lending versus ownership. The interest that we pay on on uh, on debt is a charge to the profit and loss account. What does it mean? It means that irrespective of whether the company earns profits or it makes losses, whatever may be the performance of the company, whatever may be the outcome of operations of the company, whether the company is doing well, it is earning profit, whether the company is not doing well, it is not earning profits, it is incurring cash losses or overall losses, whatever the case may be, the interest needs to be paid on the to the lenders. Interest is as much uh, a charge against the company as is the, the expense or the payments on account of other facilities obtained by the enterprise. For example, the power bill, the salaries and uh, other expenses that are incurred by the company. So, interest is a charge against the company, it needs to be debited to the profit and loss account uh, above the line that is uh, and um, it is in a sense the, the rent that you pay for the utilization of money of the lenders. So, to that extent uh, interest is mandatory and interest is, uh, is independent of the profits of the company and interest must be debited to the profit and loss account irrespective of whether the company earns profits or not. However, what about dividend? Well, dividend is an appropriation of profits, it is a distribution of profits. It is the if a company earns profits, then it is the discretion of the company in general meeting. I will come back to this point also, but it is the discretion of the company in general meeting as to how much of those profits are to be distributed, how much of those pro these profits are to be paid out to the to the owners of the company and the shareholders of the company and how much of it is to be retained by the company for future utilization of resources towards expansion, renovation and so on. But this is a very fundamental difference that I, re I reiterated this point, interest is a charge against the profits, it is a mandatory payment, dividend is discretionary, dividend is an appropriation of profits. So, this, this is a fundamental philosophical difference between the concept of debt and the concept of equity. Now, this difference gives rise to the tax treatment or the tax implications of interest and dividend. The, as far as the government is concerned, the ta tax uh, uh, legislation is concerned, it views interest on the same pedestal 
uh, as other mandatory payments like salaries, wages, power bills, expenses on account of uh, administration, selling and so on. And as such, because it, it, is, it considers lenders as not being part owners of the companies, not having ownership rights in the company, not having decision making powers in so far as the, the, the operations of the business is concerned and as such the, the, in, the tax legislations consider interest as an expense and uh, which, is, which is also justified by the fact that interest is debited to the profit and loss account and not to the appropriation account. And therefore, on account of this fact, if you debit an amount of 100 rupees on account of interest uh, to the profit and loss account, your tax liability decreases uh, by the equivalent amount of tax payable on those 100 rupees. For example, if the tax rate is 30 percent, then the tax liability decreases by 30 percent. The net result of this is that the effective cost to you of the borrowing of funds comes down. In, in some sense, you may say you may say that the government is funding a part of your interest cost uh, um, which has now decreased from 100 rupees to 70 rupees. This is this phenomenon is given a technical name which is called the interest tax shield. However, in the case of dividend there is no such a protection afforded under the tax legislations. A dividend, why it is not so? Because obviously, dividend is a distribution, it is an appropriation of profits and because it is part of a profits, it is simply distributed to the shareholders because the company decides to do so uh, and therefore, uh, it does not attract any tax protection. You do not get any tax shield on the amount of dividend that you pay out to the shareholders. Let us uh, investigate this example further. Uh, let us investigate this issue further. This is very important uh, for financial decision making. We consider two companies A and B that are identical in all operational respects except for the financing plan. Uh, a is a fully equity finance with a capital of 100 units, whatever those units may be. B has 60 percent of 20 percent debt, 20 percent is the annual interest rate on debt. It, that means, it has 60 units of debt and 40 units of equity. It has a debt equity uh, mix in which 60 units are of debt and 40 units are of equity. The, whereas, A is fully equity finance, the entire amount is equity. Let us assume that in the first year of operations, the company makes a gross profit of 60 percent. Both companies being identical in operational aspects make the same gross profit. Let us say the gross profit is 60 units of money and the other expenses uh, uh, in relation to the operations is 20. So, the EBIT turns out to be 40. Okay. Let us see how the, the in financing structure influences the outcome of the company as far as the shareholders are concerned. Uh, look at this, uh, uh, this table here, uh, company A and B are given, uh, both have the same gross profit of 60 units each. Uh, A after both companies have uh, uh, administrative and other related expenses, operational expenses, uh, indirect operational expenses of 20, uh, so that the EBIT turns out to be 40 in each case. Now, as far as company A is concerned, it is entirely equity finance, so there is no interest cost. As far as company B is concerned, it has 60 units of money financed at 20 percent per annum, so it has an interest cost of 12 units. So, the PBT turns out to be 40 for A and 28 for B and uh, with the tax rate of 30 percent, the profit after tax turns out to be 28 for A and 19.6 for B. The capital in the case of A is 100 because it is entirely equity finance. The capital in the case of B is only 40 because it is financed by 60 for uh, 60 units of debt and 40 units of equity. And you can easily see that the return of return on equity turns out to be 0 0.28 for A and 0 0.49 for B. So, look at how the introduction of debt into the financing mix has resulted in a massive increase in the return on equity. This is called the leverage effect. Let us see what are the reasons for this. There are two reasons for this. One is if you look at it carefully, 
number one is that the EBIT, the EBIT if you look at the EBIT, the EBIT is being generated at the rate of 40 percent. In other words, the return on investment of both the companies is 40 percent, 40 upon the total investment which is 100. So, if EBIT is 40, the total investment is 100. So, the ROI is 40 percent in each case. However, part of that investment is being funded by debt by company B at a cost of 20 percent. So, in other words, that 20 percent financed money is also earning for company B at the rate of 40 percent. The surplus of 20 percent adds value to the equity shareholders and therefore, the, the return on equity grows. Let me repeat, the EBIT or the return on investment in both cases is 40 percent. However, when you find that that 60 percent of the funding that is obtained by company B is obtained at 20 percent. In other words, 60 units of money out of that 100 units of total capital are, are being uh, are being uh, earned or by are being uh, procured by company B at the rate of 20 percent. But these funds are earning 40 percent in company B. So, while they are paying out for 20 percent to the debt holders, they are earning 40 percent and this adds value to the uh, to the equity shareholders or the company as a whole. So, that is one reason that is the leverage effect. The second effect if you can look at if you look at it, if it was only this effect then what would have happened? Then the profits would have been not 0 0.49 or 49 percent, they would have been slightly less. But this effect is magnified even more because of the imp impact of the interest tax shield. Even that 20 percent that the company has uh, that the company is paying out on its borrowings is subject to a tax shield at the rate of 30 percent. In other words, the net cost to the company of this borrowed funds is only 12 percent. So, the 12 percent uh, borrowed funds or the bo funds borrowed at 12 percent per unit is earning at the rate of 40 percent per unit for the company and that is what is adding value for the equity shareholders. So, there are two factors which are there. One factor is that the company pre-tax on a pre-tax basis is earning more than the cost of debt and number two the cost of debt is also subject to interest tax shield which further reduces the effective cost of debt. Both the things added together operate to handsomely benefit the company and its return on equity increases from 28 percent to 49 percent. Now, but as, as we say there is nothing called free lunch. Uh, uh, at least in finance we use this this uh, phrase very very often uh, the i just illustrated how the introduction of debt into the equity capital of the company or into the total capital of the company results in magnification of the profits of the company this leverage effect as i said results in magnification of the profits but this effect also magnifies the losses let us look at the situation in the uh, in the adverse uh, adverse scenario let us assume that the both the companies have incurred losses and the gross profit is a loss it's a gross loss of 60 units for company a as well as company b the expenses are 20 units uh, as uh, uh, in the previous case we result we end up with an ebit a negative ebit of 80 units in both cases the interest cost in the case of company A is 0 as uh, it is totally equity financed. The interest cost in the case of company B is 12 because as I mentioned and I reiterated that interest is a charge against the profit. So, even if this company B is incurring losses, you cannot do away with interest. You cannot say that because I have incurred losses, because the company has in incurred losses, it will not pay interest on its debt. The de interest on debt must necessarily be paid irrespective of whether the company is in profit or in loss. What is the outcome? That, that the interest of 12 units has also to be debited to the profit and loss account, which further escalates the 
the uh, losses of company B and the loss the total amount of loss of company B now goes to 92 against 80 for company A before tax. Now, obviously, if you if you assume if you assume that the company um, companies do not pay any tax then you the the loss or the percentage loss of company uh, the return on equity that is the return on e equity the negative return on equity will be minus 80 divided by 100 that is 80 percent negative for company A whereas for company B it will be minus 92 for minus 92 divided by 40 which comes to 230 percent. So, again note how this is being magnified by the introduction of debt. Not only are profits magnified, not only is the positive return on equity magnified, but also the negative return on equity magnified. Now, suppose, suppose that so, leverage operates both ways. It operates not only to magnify the profits, but if the company falls on bad days, the leverage also operates to magnify the losses of the company because that interest component must necessarily be debited to the company and to the company's profit and loss account. Now, so here in this previous case, I ignored the tax effect of um, and the tax effect on the uh, losses. In other words, because there were losses in the company, I assumed the tax liability to be 0, which is logical. But there could be a situation where the company has earned profits in previous years and as a result of which uh, the losses of this current year could be set off against those um, profits and as a result of which we could get a tax shield again against these losses. Now, if that is the case, even then, even then what we find is that the return on equity in the case of uh, equity finance company turns out to be minus 56 percent whereas in the case of the in the hybrid financing company it turns out to be minus 161 percent so here again irrespective of whether we uh, we consider the tax liability as zero on account of losses or we assume that the tax the losses could be set off against the profits of previous years and hence we could provide for taxation on that basis. Uh, we find that the difference between the, the two still magnifies due to the leverage effect. So, uh, to reiterate the takeaway from this is that if a company has a levered capital structure, in other words, if it replaces uh, equity by debt, it magnifies both its profits as well as its losses. On, a, on two counts, number one, usually uh, the um, the uh, on number one necessarily that uh, the interest on account of debt must be charged to the profit and loss account, and number two, the effect of tax on debt is to allow for a shield on that, uh, which does not uh, which does not accrue to the company on the dividends that it pays. Now, we come to a very another interesting issue, another philosophical issue associated with, uh, with uh, equity. Um, as uh, we discussed here uh, uh, just a few minutes back, um, the uh, and in that particular example, we saw that if we replace equity by debt, we tend to magnify the possibility of earning higher profits. So, there could be very well a temptation to replace equity significantly and, and have high debt companies. What happens? in such a situation what operates against such a philosophy of having a very high debt finance company, a company with a very high debt equity ratio, what is again what operates against such a philosophy that is the next question that we need try to address. Now, if you uh, as I will illustrate with this example, equity operates as a cushion for the lenders. Uh, higher the amount of equity in a company, higher is the safety net, higher is the safety protection, higher is the safety cushion that is available to lenders. In other words, if a company falls on bad days, uh, the interest of the lenders in terms of repayment of principal and interest is protected more, um, as much more as the amount of equity subsists in the company. Let us take an example. Now, 
uh, yes, let us take an example. Uh, let us take a very simple case. Let us say we are starting a company at t equal to 0. A company has a fixed assets of 50 units of money and it has cash of 150 units of money um, which is financed by a capital of 40 units of money and an equity of 100 and, and a debt of 160 units of money. Okay. So, let us assume that in the first year of operations, the total purchases are 150 units, uh, the sales are 100 units uh, and the company has incurred, there is no closing stock and as a result of which the company has incurred a cash loss of uh, 50 units, there is no depreciation as well. Let us ignore these things, let us keep the traction very simple. So, what would the balance sheet look like at the end of the year? And the balance sheet would look like this, as fixed assets 50. Uh, cash 100 because 50 of the cash has been wiped off through cash losses. So, we are now left with only 100 units of cash and uh, what happens to the liability side that is very interesting. As I mentioned uh, uh, in the context of uh, defining debt that the lenders have a preemptive right to repayment of principal and interest. In other words, first of all the lenders would be repaid and then the equity shareholders would be repaid. Operating, operating the statement the other way around, we can say that the losses would operate first of all to wipe off, wipe off equity and then they would affect the interests of the lenders. In other words, and this is also justified by our contention that the equity shareholders are the owners of the company and they take the substantive business risk. So, if the, the if there is a loss in the company, the loss would first operate to wipe out the or to reduce or to curtail the equity capital of the company to affect the equity capital of the company and once the, on, that is wiped out, then we come back to the lenders and the in interest of the lenders would then start getting affected as is happening in this particular situation. If you look at this, the loss for the year is 50, the equity was 40. So, obviously, the entire equity is wiped out, but even after wiping out the entire equity, what we find is that the, inter that the entire losses have not been accounted for and therefore, what will happen is that 10 units of money would be deducted or would be reduced from the interest of the lenders. You can also look at it this way, if this company was to be liquidated today, let us assume that the fixed assets realize their book value and therefore, the fixed assets would give you 15 units of money and the cash that is available with you is is 100. So, the total resources that are available to you uh, uh, is 150 units of money. Against this, the lenders have lent you 160 units of money, but because you have no money with you, the company is bankrupt. The company will only pay 150 units of money to the lenders and obviously, the entire equity capital is wiped out. So, this is the situation. This is how the dynamics will operate in this situation. Let us now look at a slightly a slight variant of this. Let us change the equity capital from 40 for the equity capital to 60 for the equity capital and let us reduce the amount of debt from 160 to 140. So, this is what the situation would uh, the new situation, let us say instead of the previous uh, uh, debt equity uh, relationship which was 160 versus 40, let us now have 140 versus 60 and let us again assume that the company has incurred a loss of 50 units of money. Now, what happens? Now, if you look at it carefully, uh, the company suppose it is liquidated, then what happens? The company has 150 units of cash with it, 50 from cash balance and 50 from uh, sorry, 50 from the liquidation of fixed assets and 100 for the cash balance. And against this, the lenders have only lent to their stakes are confined to 140 and as a result of which we pay, pay them up, up to their book value and the rest uh, of the loss is, uh, is transferred to the equity capital get, which gets reduced from 60 to 10 and this 10 units of money are returned to the equity capital. So, what is the takeaway? The takeaway is that lower the amount of debt, higher the amount of equity, greater is the protection to the lenders, greater is the protection to the lenders to 
um, greater is the protection to the lenders or greater is the safety to the lenders, greater is the cushion to the lenders uh, in so far as their interests in the company are concerned. Thinner is this cushion, as the cushion gets thinner and thinner by, by the generation of losses by a company, uh, the protection to the lenders before the interests get prejudicially affected becomes uh, uh, more and more prominent. The risk of default becomes more and more prominent as the company moves along uh, uh, generating losses on and on again. Now, there is a related questionnaire, there is a related questionnaire that question is uh, I talked about uh, let us go back to this balance sheet, I talked about this capital being 0. Uh, the question arises why cannot this capital be negative? Why, why do not we have a situation where the equity shareholders are directed to bring in more money and why the interests of lenders are prejudicially affected? Why not repay the entire amount that they have lent of 160 uh, and uh, ask the equity shareholder, shareholders to bring in 10, mon, 10 units of money and use that 10 units of money to uh, extinguish the interests of the lenders in full? The question, the answer to this question lies in the concept of limited liability. So, this is a very important uh, issue which needs uh, to be explained at this point before we proceed further. You see, uh, when a company is incorporated, uh, as most of the companies are uh, the com uh, under the Companies Act, the company has a choice of being incorporated as company limited by shares, company limited by guarantee or an unlimited company. By and large, ma majority of the companies that engage in commercial business are companies that are limited by shares. What does it mean? What it means is that if a shareholder, if an investor takes up let us say 100 shares of 100 shares of rupees 10 each in that company. If an investor invests 100 in 100 shares of the company uh, uh, at rupees 10 each and let us say he pays of 10, uh, 5 rupees uh, together with the application and he is allotted those, um, those 100 shares. That means, he has paid 500, 500 rupees against a total amount, a total value of shares of uh, worth of shares of 100, uh, 1000 rupees that is 100 into 10 rupees per share that is the and that is the uh, value of the shares, nominal value of the office share holding. Now, the concept of limited liability says that the maximum amount, maximum further amount that the investor can be asked to bring in, in the event that the company has insufficiency of funds to pay off its creditors, to pay off its lenders is confined to the balance amount of uh, money that is yet to be paid on his shareholding. A as I mentioned in this example, the, sh the investor has already paid 500 rupees, so has to pay 500 rupees more. Now, the point is he can be asked to pay, he can be called upon to pay, it is called a call, he, he can be called upon to pay another 500 rupees, but the company cannot call upon him to pay under any circumstances even a rupee more than the amount that is due on his shares. And if in the event that the shareholder or the investor has paid up the entire amount on his share, uh, share uh, on his nominal uh, shareholding that is he has paid up let us say in this example he has paid up the entire 1000 amount then the company has no recourse to this shareholder for, for, for asking for further funds of money against those shareholdings. So, that is what we mean by limited liability. The liability of the shareholder of the investor who is holding equity shares in the company of a company which is limited by, uh, uh, limited by shares is confined to the amount that remains unpaid if any on his holding of shares. If the shares are fully paid up, then the investor or the shareholder cannot be asked to bring in any money even in the event of winding up of the company or in the event of the funds with the company being insufficient to pay off its lenders. So, that is the reason why in this particular example which you look at the slide, the capital is 
the maximum capital that can be wiped off is zero. You cannot have negative capital. In other words, you cannot ask the shareholders to bring in any more money and thereby uh, uh, repay the lenders of the full amount that is due to them. The lenders will have to suffer on account of the inadequacy of the funds or uh, inadequacy of resources with the company to make their full repayment or repayment and interest. Uh, we will continue from here in the next class. Thank you.